Hello, and welcome to this third installment of educational webcasts focused on power generation, building sustainable energy programs with biogas. Uh, I am your moderator, Nick Kelch. Uh, I've worked in the electric power business at Caterpillar for 13 years, and I'm currently part of Caterpillar's business development team. Michael Devine has product and business development responsibilities for Caterpillar's electric power division and is our resident biogas applications expert. In Michael's 36 years with Caterpillar, he's held positions in manufacturing, service engineering, product development, project, project management, as well as education and training. Um, Michael has developed biogas projects really around the world and is uh, well known and respected throughout the electric power industry. So without further ado, uh, Michael, please take it away. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here with us today. A number of things we'd like to go over today. First off, is just a real brief uh, idea about the anaerobic digesters that are in use today for many of the applications we'll be talking about. Some of the industries that the biogas products um, offer potential for, some rules of thumb on feasibility and economics, uh, some obstacles that we see and how to work with some of those obstacles, uh, biogas plant owning and operating costs, some of the important features of that, and the importance of project reliability and uptime. Also, minimizing plant downtime as a function of that by planning for proper maintenance. So we'll be covering a lot of those uh, items here today. Um, anaerobic digestion, for m all of you or most of you here today, is uh, no science to it. It's a basically a biological process uh, creating the biogas, basically in an oxygen-free environment. And for the most part, uh, most biogases are typically in a range of about 60% methane, have uh, carbon dioxide somewhere in a 35% range, and then also have other gases that are a part of that. And what we're talking about are digesters, or basically engineered processes to be able to encapsulate that anaerobic digestion. And we see them in three different basic types. Um, covered lagoons is probably one of the least expensive and easiest to build and requires the least amount of maintenance. Basically a cover over a pit where you put effluent in for it to go through the anaerobic process. The cover is there to be able to maintain the, uh, the area as well as to capture the gas and then pull that out for some suitable use. Um, disadvantages of those types of things tend to be the large footprint required for these types of processes. The cover um, oftentimes has some challenges with life, particularly if you have a lot of livestock in the area, deer and cattle walking out on top of them aren't real good for those units, but, um, but they're usually a pretty sound um, investment, very sound area to be. Uh, they tend to be for use with warmer climates. The very cold climates of north uh, tend to be problematic in that the temperature tends to dissuade the bugs from working on the effluent in the system. Second system that is uh, used quite regularly is a plug flow system. And these have a real good track record with uh, digester type plants. Require, you know, uh, working with manure, particularly of, of higher solids, so an 11 to 14% range. So what you do is you mix water with the effluent and push it through the system. And as it moves down through the system, will digest. It's a very popular, very relatively inexpensive, relatively easy process to build and uh, is quite common, particularly through the Midwest U.S. The third system is the more of a complete mix system. It is a more complex, uh, more expensive system, but can be used with either scrape or flush systems, which give it a lot of flexibility. Um, and it's more expensive to build than the traditional ones, but it also gives you better results as a rule. Uh, mechanical mixing is required, so it's a mechanical process that continues on uh, through the process. More often than not, in, in particularly in, the, um, in that complete mix process, you're going to be mixing the effluent of the um, wherever you're getting from, and you're going to mix some co-substrates with it, some other materials that will help to stabilize the production of biogas and to reduce the amount of CO2 that's done. And there's a recipe that, depending on you know, each site being different, there's a recipe that will be put together that will make the best combination or the best mix. And these co-digestive materials include energy crops, uh, you know, different kinds of feedstocks, dairy waste, organic waste, 
any kind of a green non-food waste and many animal byproducts that could be used to put into these. The area that we look at in terms of the higher potential yields tend to be the, uh, the products as you can see off the chart here. So any of the fatty acids, uh, the, the fatty type things, the baked goods, the waste grease types of things offer uh, very high biogas potentials and are really great to be working into these uh, applications. You notice the lower producing biogas is the actual liquid uh, swine manure, or the cattle manure that would be located on there. So co-digesting can oftentimes add a lot of value to this process and give a, a much higher grade of the, uh, the methane that's produced. And as in all natural functions, there's a, a rhythm to this. So depending on your retention time, the hydraulic retention time that you have, the um, gas is going to be producing particularly strong at the, very, at the beginning of the process and will tail off over time. So what we're trying to do is optimize the, the residence time and the amount of gas that you're producing, being able to meet the needs of your local requirements for, um, for making sure that the effluent is actually clean as you release it, either for uh, use as a fertilizer or other products that you're going to be working with. Many of the different kinds of applications that we typically see are, are quite common and, and things that we readily know. Landfill gas to energy projects are readily known and we see them a lot and have used them a lot. Basically, you're placing a well in a landfill and you're, um, you're trying to take that, that, uh, the gas from the landfill and then be able to bring it into a facility, collect it, bring it into a facility, clean it, and then use it for, uh, for collecting gas. One of those systems could look very similar to this, where you've got a gas cleanup skid and power generation at the site where you're going to be doing uh, transforming energy and putting that on the grid. So very common to have one or multiple units located at a site to be able to do this type of activity. In digester gas applications, that is also another item that is um, quite commonly used. And for wastewater treatment plants, we see that a lot. Uh, so in many of these larger facilities where you can have multiple generator sets sitting on a site, you're taking the waste uh, gas off of the wastewater treatment plant. You can use the heat from the engines for um, uh, heat recovery to be able to help the anaerobic digestion in the process. And in many cases, uh, if the gas is not a consistent supply, the biogas is not created consistently, whether it be due to weather conditions or to different um, materials coming into the wastewater plant, uh, you can supplement the biogas, the methane in the biogas, with pipeline uh, gases as well. Here's another application where they've got, um, again, multiple units. It's a dual gas system, again, using uh, natural gas. In this case, it's weather related in that um, in the Western Canada, in this particular area, during the winter months, the gas production is down quite a bit, but yet they rely on the heat and the power from the generator sets to actually run the operations. So they'll bring in natural gas to supplement the gas on these systems uh, for, the, for their uh, wastewater treatment plant. Industrial biogas is a very up and coming area in that basically anywhere that you're doing any work with um, biomass materials, uh, food storage, all that, um, can be an excellent opportunity for using power generation. In this case, they're taking the uh, water that comes off of the cleaning process of the processed rice, they're putting it into an anaerobic digester and collecting the gas and returning it back to the facility for power to power the facility. They're also taking heat off of the system to be able to use it for process heat in the uh, uh, basically heat the hot water they're using in the process of cleaning the rice. In a system like this, you can also use it in places like a brewery where you have a, um, you have a, a process that you're using, a fermenting process, and they're taking the gas off of the process and actually running the generator sets with that gas. And these generator sets can then use the heat from the, um, from the engine process to be able to use for their process cleaning. So they can use it for cleaning, they can use it for heating the element, keeping the, um, the digestive process and the fermenting process up at a, at a rate that is um, optimum for their finished products, to create the finished products that they're looking for. 
in the ag biogas area. Um, whether you're talking about any confinement operation could basically be a, a, a candidate for this type of application. So if I've got hogs or uh, if I've got a dairy for milking, if I've got um, cattle for, uh, for feed, for um, feeding out cattle, if I have chickens or turkeys or any other confinement type of an application where there's either a flush or a scrape application to get the effluent out of the facility, um, the biogas applications can work very well in those environments. Um, it could be something as simple as the traditional lagoon type of system like you see here on this hog confinement operation. You have the basic confinement operation, you're flushing the floors and bringing it down into the um, digester, basically into the lagoon, and uh, then taking the gas off that to power, in this case, a pair of generator sets to, uh, parallel to the grid. Another alternative can be um, using a complete mix biogas plant where you're adding, in this case, corn silage substrate to be able to uh, richen the, uh, the supply of biogas coming from the digester. And at the end, they use the basically cleaned digestate to be able to use as a fertilizer to enhance the crop operations on that particular facility. Owning and operating costs on these things is very important, and trying to understand the process is, is very important to us. Uh, but knowing the kinds of equipment that you're putting on site can be very beneficial. Um, I know Caterpillar has been doing uh, business with the power generation uh, with these types of units since the late 1930s, early 1940s, and have been doing low energy configurations on a regular basis since the early 1950s. Today's product lines range anywhere from about 50 to 4,000 kilowatts on biogas products with over 12,900 um, 12, 12, megawatts of electrical gas products in service today. So a large variety of products that can be used in a multitude of these types of applications. But the equation for profitability is what most people are looking for. And basically we're looking for potential revenue times the availability of that unit as a percent, uh, less the owning and operating cost of it to determine the profitability of one of these projects. So from the potential revenue side, what we're looking at is very simply the capacity in terms of kilowatts or megawatts, um, and you're taking that megawatt hours and you're multiplying times the value of the energy that you're creating from that engine. And you're creating a revenue stream, or in this case, it'd be about $112 an hour for a 20-cylinder engine. So if you multiply that by the 8760, the number of hours per year, you come out with about $980,000 in revenue per year that you would expect to be able to see from this unit. Now, that revenue represents only the electric side, and if there's a benefit to the heat and power, the heat that you can get off of it, the engine, whether it be through the heat from the jacket water or heat through the exhaust, that would be incremental to this value right here. But for the purposes of these illustrations, we'll just talk today about the value of the electric power and what effect that has on these systems. Now, the availability becomes uh, the next part of that equation, and it becomes very valuable. And they usually determine that as a capacity factor. The capacity factor is basically a percent of time that the generator set is operating and producing kilowatts, or the operational availability. Now, there are a number of things that enter into this, and one is just simply the amount of time that the engine runs in and of itself. So take away your scheduled maintenance, take away any time that's um, there because of parts and service availability, uh, whether it be issues or just finding getting the parts to be able to fix a unit and when it's not operating correctly. And whether it's the unit itself or the switchgear or the facility itself, if the unit is down because of whether it's the facility related or otherwise, all of that is a factor. The engine load factor also is to be considered in this part because the fuel availability, if I can't make enough fuel out of my digester to run my engine at full load, I obviously am not going to be able to get full capacity out of that generator set and I'm not going to be able to receive the revenue that would be there. Fuel quality can be an issue. If my percent of methane drops significantly below the level that the engine is capable of handling, that could certainly drive the kilowatts down or the kilowatt availability down. Again taking away from your revenue source. And if there are D rates that are required for the engine for whatever reason, those would need to be taken into consideration. But the generating facility, the availability of the utility that you're working with, 
or your facility itself if you're using it as a local load. All of those certainly make a difference. And just simply the digester availability is important. If the digester is not available, I cannot make revenue with that unit. Now, m most people talk about these in terms of electric efficiency and about capacity, and you really need to understand the effect of both of those as it relates to the profitability of a system. If we're looking at uh, two units, identical units, each of these is 1,000 kW, and we're valuing the value of energy produced, the electric energy produced at $70 a megawatt hour, and we're putting a value to the gas at about $2 per million BTU of, of price. The heat rate on these two engines is different, and the capacity factor it will be the same for the purpose of this illustration. And so the capacity factor we're saying is 96% of the available runtime, the units will be available, or the available kilowatt hours are available from that unit. So the rest of that time would be for servicing the unit or uh, down for, for some other reason. But if you're looking at the generator set efficiency, because of that heat rate difference, uh, unit B is at about 42% electrical efficiency. The unit A is at 39%. What that's going to drive is that the fuel cost is going to be uh, seen as an advantageous thing for unit B, and you'll see about a 2.2% revenue advantage as a result of that. Now, we take those same two units, and instead of, you know, differing the electrical efficiency, we'll make the electrical efficiency the same, and we'll differ the capacity factor. So a difference between 90% availability and 96% availability would give about a 6.25% revenue advantage to unit A, simply because it had a revenue uh, difference. So understanding the efficiency of the generator is important, and it certainly does play a role. But understanding the ability of that generator to generate kilowatt hours for the long term is also a very important part of the equation when you're trying to figure out the value that a generator set will have for you in your application. Now, if we talk about owning and operating costs, that's yet another category that, that is of importance. And when you're doing this, you're usually doing it in a cost per kilowatt hour basis. Now, when you talk about the costs, you're talking about your preventive maintenance, your scheduled and unscheduled maintenance and repairs as being part of that cost factor. If you're talking about the kilowatt hours, you're talking about the production of kilowatt hours and those being sold to the marketplace. So that if I've got parasitic loads, uh, if I have you know, capacity factor issues about the availability or fuel availability, if I've got ambient conditions or power factor D rates that are required on these units, those ought to be taken into consideration prior to the time that you try and figure out what your cost per kilowatt hour are because any of the parasitic losses, for example, do not count as kilowatts that you are going to be able to take advantage of and to receive revenue for as a result of that. So what we look at is, if you look at the unit over time and you're looking at different load factors, the load factor can make a big difference in your cost estimates. So understand that you know, not all engines run at 100% load all the time. And, um, and most of these engines are not any exception to that. So uh, understand what your load factor is and what you expect it to run as you're starting to develop your maintenance costs. In this case, you're going to be doing top ends um, at various times, do an in-frame overhaul, which is basically bearing roll ends and um, uh, cylinder packs. Then you're going to do top ends again, and then you'll do a major overhaul on the engine. At 100% load, this would be what the standard maintenance schedule would look like for that particular unit. If we had an 85% load factor, what that does is it does not load the engine as heavily, and so the engine has longer life. And as a result, your maintenance intervals will get extended as well. So your oil change intervals, your top ends, your in frames, your majors, all of those um, different maintenance exercises are going to be done at periods that are longer than it would be as if I had a higher load factor on that engine. So it will spread out the cost per kilowatt over time. Now, also keep in mind that typically if I have that lighter load factor, I also have less kilowatts that I'm receiving benefit from. So my cost per kilowatt may still be similar, but my maintenance intervals may actually be at a longer interval. So this gives a good idea about the, the type of, of extension you'd expect to see. Uh, on a predictive maintenance
system, what you're trying to do is not just say, I'm going to change the oil because it's time. You're going to change the oil because it needs changing. Um, so the oil has additives in there that are designed for, um, for biogas applications and that the total base number, for example, consuming acids that will be forming in the engine uh, may get used up in sooner or later, depending on what your condition of your gas is. So you're going to try to set your maintenance schedules to be able to optimize the periods that you're doing. You don't want to do a top-end overhaul before you need to, but yet you want to do it before it fails. And so understanding how that engine works and setting up your maintenance programs to understand the wear trends and the long-term benefit that you're looking for is going to give you the best maintenance plan to reduce your downtime and to improve your operating expenses. So there's two ways to look at this. Uh, for people who don't do the predictive trends, there's a reason why we publish in our service manuals you know, periods at which we would expect to see units uh, to be serviced at. And usually those are very conservative numbers in the service manuals in an effort to try to make sure that the engine does not fail at, at any time. But if you're doing your predictive maintenance, you can have actually better, um, better economics on your engine and you can reduce your operating costs sometimes up to 15% in terms of your service costs up in, in that range by measuring valve recession, by looking at the uh, blow-by measurements in, from the crankcase ventilation system, by looking at your oil consumption and watching what's going on in there, uh, by taking a look at the exhaust emissions in the engine. All of those are telltale signs of activities that you may need to do for your maintenance. And by registering and recording all that, it can be very valuable in the long-term benefit for your system. Now, some of the contaminants that we see in biogas applications are basically in two different areas. One is, uh, you know, corrosive contaminants like sulfurs, halides, and other acids. And then other contaminants like um, silicons um, and water vapor that you'll be able to see inside these engines. If I'm looking at hydrogen sulfide, the hydrogen in there mixes in the fuel, mixes with the water in, after the combustion process. One of the major um, chemical reactions in the engine that occurs basically changes the fuel and air mixture that's going in there into water. And so that water mixes with the hydrogen that comes in with the fuel and creates a weak sulfuric acid. And an engine that is um, not protected or does not have a good uh, means to be able to, uh, to resist the corrosion from that sulfuric acid, like you see the aftercooler core on the right, uh, that second stage core, which got very cool, condensed out those acids, and it just ate up that copper um, aluminum aftercooler core. A stainless steel core, for example, as a material that would, would resist that, as you see on the left, would be very good with that kind of a fuel and be very resistant to it. So understanding the kind of fuels that you've got coming in becomes very important to know the types of materials that we need to put into the engine in order to make that work correctly. The halogenated uh, hydrocarbons or the chlorines and fluorines that you'll see in a lot of applications, uh, particularly wastewater treatment plants and in landfills, uh, those um, have basically the same effect. The difference is you're doing, you're creating hydrochloric or hydrofluoric acids. Again, they all attack the internal components, particularly the bright metals inside the engine. And uh, the stainless steels and taking out the bright metals from the engine can certainly help in making those correct. Uh, silicon, or basically dirt, uh, believe it or not, is common in landfills and in ag biogas applications and industrial biogas applications. And the engine sees these uh, elements coming down through the line. A good air filter or fuel filter system is important, and understanding the level of contamination you expect to see is very important in the engine. Obviously, if, if, um, if the silicon gets into the engine, it will cause wear and premature wear in the engine and will accelerate your service intervals on these units. Uh, siloxanes is another um, element that we see, particularly, again, in landfills and wastewater treatment plants. And it's an element that it's a man-made kind of a uh, silicon that uh, deposits itself in the inside of an engine. And here you can see some buildup that has occurred on uh, some valves in the valve seat area. And if some of those pieces of siloxane that are basically like a, 
uh, ceramic kind of a material as it bakes onto the unit. If those chip off and get stuck in the valve uh, seat area, uh, you can get the valve guttering that you see in the right-hand uh, photo on that issue. So what we're trying to do is to limit the amount of, of these siloxanes, or you're trying to get an engine that is going to be able to take care of that. Now, what happens is these siloxanes build up in the cylinders, and it has the effect of increasing the compression ratio in the engine, which changes some of the dynamics and particularly the emission capabilities in those engines. Here's another view of some siloxane damage that had been done. Look at the top left is a new uh, normal spark plug in the wear you'd expect to see on a normal J-gap plug. The view on the right is one that's been contaminated heavily. And below you see turbine wheels and exhaust systems. Uh, the exhaust systems uh, get hit pretty hard with siloxanes that come through the system and into the uh, exhaust systems. Now, all manufacturers have recommended guidelines for fuels, and it's Obviously, best to stay within those guidelines in order to achieve the best service life out of these units. But it's basically a determination that the, that the owner needs to make as to whether cleaning the gas before it goes into the engine makes economic sense or does it matter, uh, can I make better economic sense by increasing the amount of maintenance that I do on the engine and not paying for the gas cleanup systems on these units. So all of these guidelines are set uh, this happens to be some examples of the guidelines that we see on, on the traditional Caterpillar engines, but the key here is that you're going to be looking at these in terms of part per million or in megajoules per normal meter cubed, and you're going to be um, looking at these, so you're looking at a volume of gas, a volume of contaminants, but you're also looking at that not in terms of cubic feet or in terms of uh, by meter, but you're going to look at it by heat volume. So the volumetric energy of the content makes a difference. So if I have a 60% a methane content gas or a 30% methane content gas, it's going to be significantly different and basically double the amount of contaminants in the gas that's at 30% methane content in order to be able to generate the same amount of energy out of that engine. So understanding your contaminant level and understanding the amount of heat energy in the fuel that you have is going to be very important to determine whether you're within the guidelines and you're going to be at risk of having additional maintenance on your engine. If we look at some other areas uh, that are important to us, um, the low heat value or the, um, the actual BTU per cubic foot of the unit is going to have an effect on the size of the fuel system. On the example I just gave, 60% methane, if I go to 30% methane, I'm going to have to have twice the amount of gas flowing through that fuel system in order to be able to do the same work from that engine. Um, the maximum CO2 level, CO2 is basically a fire extinguisher in there, and it's basically slowing down the flame speed in the engine. And so the, um, the, there's a maximum level of CO2 that will allow us to be able to keep the valve temperatures and the exhaust system temperatures in safe operating range. And by safe, I'm suggesting that you're going to be uh, minimizing your maintenance levels. If you exceed those levels, you're going to see excessive maintenance required on your engine. There's another item called the methane to free inert ratio, and that basically deals with the fuel stability. So that if I have too many inert items in there, particularly nitrogen and CO2, uh, the more I have, the harder it's going to be to light that off in cylinder. Now, what is the free uh, inert ratio, what does that do? Basically, you calculate it by looking at the amount of methane in your fuel, the amount of CO2 plus the free nitrogen. Basically, free nitrogen is nitrogen that is not connected with the air. So air being 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. If I've got oxygen in there and I've got nitrogen, we assume that those two are together as air. And so those do not count for, this, for the purpose of this calculation. But additional nitrogen that is coming from your anaerobic or digestive source does make a difference, and we do care about that. Now, some of these um, engines can be modified to be able to counteract some of these contaminants, things like corrosion-resistant materials and uh, oversizing corrosion-resistant fuel systems, taking the bright metals out of the uh, formative areas in the engine, like bearing surfaces and so on, using brass as opposed to the aluminum uh, back steel, back to aluminum type bearings. All of those can be very beneficial in trying to extend the life of the unit 
without de de degrading the operation of the engine at all. If we start looking at the protection that we see from these systems or the uh, being able to protect the gas, one thing that is pretty common on all biogas applications is taking the water, excess water out of the system. Engines are designed to be able to operate at about 80% uh, relative humidity, non-condensing water in the uh, vapor, if you will, in the, uh, in the fuel that comes down. But most biogas applications exceed that by quite a bit. So there's usually a, a, a chiller, a demister, heat, you know, heat exchangers, coalescing filters of some sort. Uh, depending on the type of system that you have, these will be important to make sure that you, um, that you get as much of the water out of the fuel as you can. And more water out of the fuel is better. The engine will run far better with less water than more. But up to 80% non-condensing is what the typical limits are for engines. Protecting the engine from hydrogen sulfide, there are different types of filter systems that are available. This happens to be an activated carbon filter that you would see as a dual filter system. And it uses the carbon pellet, similar to what you see here, that would absorb the hydrogen sulfide. Uh, works far better if there's not a lot of water in there because the carbon will absorb water as well. So it'll absorb more hydrogen sulfide if there's less water in the system. So you usually dewater the system before you bring it in to these activated filters and uh, use it that way. Now, we see these as being good for engines that are, say, 1,000 kW and below, particularly. Uh, you get above that, and some of these filter systems can get pretty unwieldy with the activated carbon. There are other uh, filter mediums that can be used for, um, for use in these higher volume gas areas, typically a little bit more money on a cost per kilowatt basis. But as you get into those larger areas, it starts to make more sense to use those types of systems. If we look also at the um, siloxane treatments, um, another hot topic, as you see the higher compression ratios on engines today, the higher compression ratio engines tend to tolerate um, fewer contaminants than do lower compression ratio engines. It just so happens, though, that the higher compression ratio engines are also typically your, your better efficiency engines. That's why you've got the higher compression ratios. So. Um, in many of these cases, you're going to be looking at trying to remove siloxanes on the high efficiency engine. If that's what you need, or if you have no alternative, or if you, you have so many siloxanes in there that you absolutely must uh, reduce siloxane, uh, there are systems that are available that will do that. Now, depending on your site, your specific site conditions, high compression ratio engines will also oftentimes require specialized siloxane removal just because of the challenges they have because of their higher compression ratio. They tend to absorb or stick more siloxanes in their cylinder than lower compression ratios do. Now, when you have one of these siloxane removal systems, you, to understand your cost of operation, you really need to understand both the cost of the siloxane system and the cost to maintain it, uh, both from a power perspective as well as from an element perspective, uh, to make sure that you're going to evaluate that properly make sure that the costs are in line. So by protecting the engine with those types of systems, you tend to extend the overhaul intervals. You tend to have longer spark plug life. You have better oil change intervals, better component life, and lower overall maintenance costs. The costs on these units can be almost double, as you see here. This is a system that we basically took the cost of fuel out of the, the equation, but we um, have basically the maintenance that was done on this. The unscheduled maintenance and repairs increases on the higher contaminant unit, but the, specifically the cost of overhauls and most specifically the cost of top end overhauls increases rather dramatically with very high or higher siloxane um, costs that are involved in that unit. Now, these higher costs, um, certainly do add up, but it may also be that the cost of the siloxane removal system may make it such that it's going to be more expensive to remove the siloxanes and to uh, do the lower intervals on maintenance rather than increase your maintenance intervals and do away with the operating expense of the, the purchase price and the operating expense of the uh, gas conditioning system. So understanding what you're working with becomes very important at that point. 
So in order to be able to figure out what you've got, a couple key items that you need to be looking at. The fuel analysis is really the key to this thing. And getting a good fuel analysis over time, understanding what the conditions are at different times of that fuel is important, and specifically knowing what's going on with your contaminants in that system. So not only just understanding what the swings in methane are, but understand what the swings in siloxanes or in hydrogen sulfide in your halides, all of that does make a difference in that system. Evaluate your treatment options and develop a maintenance cost in dollars per kilowatt hour, both with the treated fuel and without the treated fuel. And then also understand what a long-term maintenance contract would be for these systems, to put a price on what your maintenance is going to be under both of those conditions. And that will give you the tools necessary to compare and evaluate what's, what's going on inside there. So what we find is that there's really no one right answer on whether you put siloxane removal or uh, you know, fuel treatment for um, halides and for hydrogen sulfide or not. Obviously, if the contaminants are so egregious that it becomes difficult to operate because of them, you have no choice but to condition it. But you don't have to take all of it out if you're conditioning. Just get it down to a point where the engine can tolerate it. But understanding the engine that you're choosing and understanding what those limits are is very important in that process. Review the costs and the benefits of the fuel pretreatment as well as the, um, the costs and benefits of the minimal fuel treatment. And the right best answer may be a project that has a combination of some level of treatment and optimized engine practices. Project financing has been a challenge for a lot of these biogas projects. And we see a lot of that. And a group there at Caterpillar out of the Caterpillar Financial Services Organization, Cat Power Finance, specializes in some of these engine coverages. There's a group that is actually working specifically with anaerobic digesters and wastewater treatment plants, landfill facilities, um, all different types of digesters to be able to understand and operate these systems more effectively. What we're finding is that they will do a, a number of items, both behind the fence or in a, in a facility, so in a, um, in a manufacturing facility for industrial biogas, for example. If they're dealing with corporate financing and they need um, some assistance from uh, an enterprise to be able to provide the financing, whether it be for the upfront construction costs or the actual um, financing of the project after the unit is built and operating, both of those can be accomplished here. Uh, development developer project financing is certainly available as well, and th that's something that is very traditionally done. But also on municipal projects for wastewater treatment plants or landfills, uh, government financing could be made available for these types of projects as well. Again, as I mentioned, there's the two sides of this thing, and one is the construction loan, the other side is the term loans. And so um, traditionally, um, most people think that a company like this would, would basically finance the generator sets and let the rest of it go. And what we tend to do is finance the projects so that if it makes sense and if it is in the best interest of the user, uh, what, we, what we oftentimes will do is finance the entire facility, the anaerobic digestion facility, and work with the um, side on the construction side as well as on the term loan side of the project. So um, oftentimes makes it a lot easier to figure out if, if you can work the project. Historically speaking, uh, we find that if, if you know that you've got a way to be able to finance it, you know there's a place. If you can find better financing, that's great. You've still got a project, but at least you know you've got a way to finance your project and make it work. One of the keys to this is understanding what's going on within the project, and that's not a real simple item. For example, if I've got my parent company, I need to understand, you know, where are my purchase power agreements coming from? Where am I getting my effluent or my... Um, my co-generation materials that I'm going to put into this uh, material. So you have to understand where all these long-term contracts are, and usually there's a legal agreement that needs to be in place to be able to handle all of these activities. You know, my loan security agreements with the lenders, gas suppliers, you know, what are you going to do with the gas, and do you have a long-term contract to take on that gas at a price that makes sense? If I got equipment that's going in, do I have contracts for that equipment? Do I know what the cost is? And my contractor, do I have a reputable contractor who knows how to do this, who's done digestive plants before, or at least knows and understands how to work with these things? And how do I deal with my operations and maintenance agreements? You know, are they in place and do they work 
financially for this project. That all needs to be understood as you're working through the financing on these projects. And as a result, the risk that is you know, taken on by this project usually has to get allocated and shared by the appropriate people within this, within this task organization. That's how you get a, a project approved in finance, by making sure that people know what they're taking on, that they're contracted to do that, and they have a way to be able to achieve that end. Another item that can work for some projects is that if you have a commodity basically that you're doing, if, if you're an agricultural application, uh, you can use e even the carbon credits for renewable energy offsets and actually use them to trade for product so that you can trade the future benefits that you're going to receive from that farm uh, from the application by being able to trade those in advance and getting a reduced price or low price on the entire system, whether it be the gen set or the complete system. And a CAT World Trade Organization has been doing this type of activity since the early 1980s on a worldwide basis to try and figure out how do I find the commodities that, that these users have available to them and trade for those in the marketplace, basically barter for the products that you're going to be using, both, both the parts and the services that you're going to use to keep this system operating. Now, on the financing side, there's going to be yet another um, project that's going to be coming up, and it's um, basically a project finance training session on financing biogas to electricity projects that will be occurring Wednesday, September 12th at uh, noon, and there will be information coming out. The American Biogas Council has the uh, information on their website about this show and they will have a link if you're interested in understanding more about the financing of these types of systems that will be available in the relatively near future. Uh, that concludes my prepared comments today. Um, let me see if uh, there's any questions that you all might have, might be able to answer. Yeah, Mike, hi. This is, uh, this is Nick Kelch. I'm back, and um, there's been a lot of lively Q&A going on, so we'll, we'll get right to it via some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, Adam Pierce of Harris Law asks, if you could uh, talk a little bit about microturbines versus reciprocating technologies for biogas applications, is there any good comparisons you can draw related to efficiency, the required gas quality or gas treatment, installed cost, et cetera? Um, well, we don't do a lot of work ourselves with the microturbines. I know that um, some work is being done with them. Um, I guess I would just uh, caution that you take a look at the maintenance costs on them. You take a look at the fuel quality that's required between a reciprocating engine and a microturbine on site. Um, and just to make sure that you've got a, a beneficial relationship there, uh, something that's going to make sense. I'm not sure what their tolerance is for uh, siloxanes or for, um, for hydrogen sulfide or halides or other contaminants. So um, I guess I'd just be doing the same thing I would do as if I were comparing two different recip engines on a site and making sure that the economics made sense. But take a look at all the, the uh, parasitic loads that might be involved with either one of the projects, um, both for the, uh, the unit itself and for the um, uh, and to make sure that, that your, your cost, on, fuel train. cost and, re, and replacement costs are going to be in line with each other. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Robert Morgan from uh, Morgan, Maxwell, and Hannah. Uh, what is the difference in overall efficiency in converting waste to biogas for the different digester technologies that you discussed, Mike? Um, the lagoon type system is probably the least efficient, and it kind of goes by cost. The least cost is going to, it just happens to be kind of the least efficient for the most part, whereas the complete mix uh, tends to be the more efficient of the two because you have a better control of the process. And so when you are controlling the effluent going in at the very, um, very high rates that you're able to do with a complete mix system, it allows you to have better control of what's coming out, which tends to give you higher quality gas with less CO2. So um, I guess if I were going to just say it straight off the top of my head that the uh, plug flow would be kind of in the middle, the lagoon would be the lowest efficiency, and the um, complete mix would be the higher efficiency. 
And if you're looking at it from a cost perspective, first cost in particular, it's basically the opposite of those two. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question here um, from Robert is, um, can you kind of give some estimates of um, the cost per pig? Well, if I, maybe if we rephrase this question, what is, is there a benchmark number of cows or pigs per kilowatt to do a, a project and then um, sort of the, maybe the cost per kilowatt to, to uh, install a complete project? Um, I found that there's not really a good answer for that in that, for example, if I'm talking about cattle, um, I'm going to have a lot a higher grade of effluent, if you will, from a dairy cow than I will from a beef cow. And that, you know, it's going to, it's almost like two to one in terms of the amount of effluent required to generate a kilowatt from, from just the two types of cows. So it, it really depends on the types of feed that you have. It depends on the types of materials that are going into these systems. And also, um, it can also equate to the different kinds of medications that you might have. Like if we had a, a hog farm where they were running about 600 part per million of hydrogen sulfide and they gave some sulfa to the hogs and all of a sudden it jumped up to about 3,200 part per million. So there's, there are a lot of different variables in there that are going to have an effect on what's going on. I found that there are some areas like the EPA that have, the, um, um, have some of the, the charts and basically the, the capability of trying to help you understand what those um, – um, what those costs are going to be and with different types of animals, their charts are as good as anyone. But if you go out on the Internet, uh, there's just a host of different locations where you can find different types of animals that will have different levels of, of um, biogas produced per animal. But it really gets down to what you're feeding them, where you are, and, um, you know, the, the type of animal that it is, even to the breed. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, on the technology side, there's been a few questions. Um, an Avtar Binning asks if there's any technologies specifically referencing laser ignition, for example, technologies uh, that Caterpillar is looking at uh, in order to burn uh, lower BTU fuels or advance or uh, increase compression ratios. Um, there are a number of technologies that are being looked at, and lasers have been on the list of, of basically all manufacturers for quite some time. Um, the challenge is getting one that's affordable that will live long enough in a cylinder that will work right. One of the eyes the problems is that the eyes in the cylinder, particularly with siloxanes and other contaminants, is that they will cover the lens of the laser and make them so they don't operate correctly. So there's, uh, there's physical challenges, and then there's just the challenge of the technology in the cylinder. Um, but the other part is that, you know, we see technologies that we can do in a lab today that none of us could afford. And it's going to be a matter of developing the technologies, the manufacturing technologies, to be able to get them to a price that makes sense in the marketplace. Thanks, Mike. Um, we had a couple questions on um, fuel treatment. Um, Akanan Vembu uh, is asking specifically, what is the cost for siloxane removal equipment? Um, it, a lot of that depends on the type of technology. Um, I don't know if I'm in a good position to represent what those costs are, but they're, they're not cheap. Oftentimes the technology will be as much on a dollar per kilowatt basis as the generator set and its equipment is. And then the uh, maintenance costs, particularly in higher siloxane environments, can be very high as well. So if I've got regeneration that needs to be done and I have uh, only so many elements that I can regenerate, or so many times I can regenerate, and so much siloxane that they can absorb before they're uh, before they don't they're not effective anymore. Uh, the more siloxanes, the more cost it's going to be to operate them. So there are two segments in there. As you're looking in the marketplace at the different technologies, um, you know it's not uncommon to see them in a 500 to 1,000 dollars a kW range. I mean they can be very expensive. Um, but I would be looking at the cost of the technology, but I would also make sure that you understand what your expectations are for cost of maintenance in those things and the operating cost of the technology as well. There's Great. a reason why we don't see a lot of, of um, siloxane removal in, say, for example, landfills that are doing, you know, 100% to be able to run um, selective catalyst reduction systems. It's, 
it's a technology that just is not a, uh, has not proven itself to be cost effective to this point. Understood. Um, Mike, thanks. We, we got a few more minutes. I'm going to keep going through a few more questions. We probably have more recently submitted questions that we'll be able to answer, but we'll just keep going here. Um, Mike, I have a couple questions asking about smaller biogas engines. One question asking about engines smaller than 500, one asking about engines smaller than 300, and what is Caterpillar's offering on smaller biogas engines? And also, um, I think they're alluding to some of maybe the emissions uh, regulations um, in in the United States, North America, that, that may impact some of those products? Um, and for the Caterpillar product lines, what we're seeing are uh, we have products that go down to about 300 kilowatts that are NSPS compliant in, in all ways so that they would be available pretty much as is on most sites to meet the NSPS standards. Uh, for some of the smaller units, uh, in that 50 to 250 kW range in particular, uh, some of those units tend to be naturally aspirated in nature, and as a result, they would not meet uh, most of the new source performance standards that we see in North America or in the States. And, uh, but we use them very extensively in Mexico and, and Asia and many other places around the world, so they're very commonly used in a lot of applications. But in places where you have uh, high emission control standards, the cost of those higher emission levels is, or the lower emission levels, is um, is pretty high on those small units. And so we tend to see from about 300 kW up that we, we see a lot more use of those applications. Thanks, Mike. Um, question, question here from Richard Maddox. Um, can you talk a little bit about gas pressures into the engine and the cost associated with complying with a gas pressure requirement? Um, most of the engines that we are working with are low-pressure regulator systems. Um, so we're talking about half PSI or even less in some cases. Um, so we're not needing a lot of gas pressure in order to be able to operate the units. Now, as a result, you're going to be wanting to parallel to the grid. It's not going to be an island mode kind of an engine, an engine you'd put and run standalone and expect it to be able to pick up large load swings because with that low of pressure, it would be difficult to get the – gas in quick enough to be able to pick up block loads. But as a parallel to the utility type of machine, they work extremely well under those circumstances. Uh, from a cost perspective, uh, it's basically the cost of the unit. Um, what we've done in, in most of these cases is oversized the fuel system so that you basically double the size of the fuel system to be able to handle the larger volume of inert material coming in with the fuel to be able to put it into the engine. And then we downsize the size of the turbocharger slightly to be able, because we don't need as much air now to, to be a, in a lean burn engine. You don't need the amount of air in there. You've got CO2 and other inert gases that are coming in through your gas, your fuel system uh, that make up some of the air. So there's a mix between the size of the turbo and the size of the fuel system, which um, is required. And then, of course, all of those systems need to be hardened against the hydrogen sulfide and other contaminants that may be coming in. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, there's a question here um, about minimum load. What, what is the reason for having a minimum load requirement on a recip engine? Uh, basically, the minimum load on a turbocharged engine. Uh, the pressure coming into that system is basically um, uh, balancing in the engine and basically it keeps it from pulling a lot of oil down the, the valve guides. So if I have enough pressure in my system, um, the, I get normal oil consumption. If I lose that pressure, my turbo basically starts to suck the oil down the valve guides, and then I start to, um, start to wet stack or get a lot of excess oil consumption. Also, the rings in your engine, in a gas engine, they're designed to operate at 100% load. I mean, that's what they're designed to do, as opposed to an automotive engine that, as a rule, is designed to run at, you know, tend to be lighter loads. Um, so what it's designed to do is run at the full load. If we get it down below, as a rule, about 50% load, you start having some of these maintenance issues. And it doesn't take long to suck a lot of oil out of those units so that the oil will then get caught behind the rings in your, in your engine and will start to carbon up the inside of the engine, which then starts to wear uh, excessively. Also, you, it'll be blowing raw oil out through your exhaust system, 
which uh, then when you heat it up tends to be a fire hazard. So it tends to be pretty bad in that way as well. But the oil consumption itself is very expensive. The cost of maintenance as a result of that tends to be very expensive. And then of course there's the, the risk of fire from wet stacking excessively. Thanks, Mike. Um, again, thanks to everyone uh, for your attendance today. And, and we certainly appreciate it here from Caterpillar and we look forward to the next one. Thanks much.